Welcome back to the Gentleman's Romantic Book Nook. This week, we read the next two adventures in The Ship Who Sang. Here's the story so far. Our journey with Helva has taken us to oceanic worlds, volcanic death cults, and orgy-filled jellyfish planets. Helva has single-handedly repopulated a planet stricken and fertile. She saved countless lives with the power of Bob Dylan and performed Romeo and Juliet with lascivious response. But the question remains, does Helva finally find love? Find out this week on The Gentleman's Romantic Book Note. Welcome, Mac, and welcome back to the interstellar journey into love and literature. I am your host, Lucky. And I am Mac Money. Tonight on GRBN, we are proud to present the second in our two-part expose on the controversial practice of placing human children into advanced science fiction machinery. Lucky, can I ask you a question right off the bat? Uh, yeah, sorry. Hang on. Let me. Um, I, I wasn't prepared for this. Um, we just got out of the lab with the new studies. Do you uh, believe yes. okay. that Elon Musk plans to put the brains of American children into the bodies of his Tesla smart cars? Yes or no? Uh, I would say yes, but he does smoke a lot of weed on Twitter these days, so I'm actually not sure what is true anymore. Um, he, we have not heard from his PR agent. Fascinating. Follow-up question. Do you believe that the characters in the Disney Pixar's Cars franchise are, in fact, shell children? Hang on, let me check my notes here. Uh, we did get an email from drdisney at disney.disney, and uh, they say that, yes, in fact, they were children stolen from their homes solely from Arizona, which I do find kind of interesting. Whoa. Okay, to drop the bit for a second, that's actually a pretty solid piece of lore. <laughs> that they're stealing children from like our most tender communities of Arizona <laughs> to create smart cars. Uh, I'm just thinking about uh, cars being in this hot-tempered zone. I mean, the babies need to be ready for that climate. It's in a desert, the whole movie, people. Wake up. Wake up, sheeple. Uh, now, I know what you're thinking. Mac, Lucky, these are cars, not spaceships. But in 2013, Disney released a movie called Planes, starring Dane Cook and Cedric the Entertainer. So, you know, it's good. And it takes place in the same universe. That movie introduces helicopter people, blimp people, and, of course, plane people. So Weren't there, like, bugs also? Weren't there small beetles that were flying around, too, which means there are micro people also involved? Where does it end? Those could be drones. Uh, I have a, I have oh. theories about that as well. <laughs> I forgot about drones. Sorry. Uh, now, I still know what you're thinking. Mac, Lucky, those are just planes. Those are not people. They're not spaceships. However, I found this little bit of tidbit <laughs> online. Uh, in July of 2017 at the D23 Expo, John Lasseter announced a third film in the Planes franchise that would explore the future of aviation in outer space. What? How? What's the second installment of the Planes franchise? <laughs> uh, it's it's called Search and Rescue. It's about like <laughs> planes that put out fires. So it's kind of I a thought big they were just there. so excited about this idea. They were like, "Screw it, we're going to number three. It's space this time." <laughs> yeah, fuck it, Planes three. <laughs> e and plane is a three. We're going to space. Jumping to the third is obviously the move to do, right? I mean, just skip the second one. Who even cares? The first sets the stage. Let's just get right to that. The good meat. <laughs> we should just we should just jump to season three of our show next week. We're back with season three of the Gentleman's <laughs> Romantic Book Note. Wetter and wilder. <laughs> that works out well. Yeah. Um, we may never know what Planes 3 was going to be about, um, but we can read The Ship You Sang by Anne McCaffrey. Well, now we've got two more of these stories under our belt. Uh, Mac, can you give us a little rundown of what happened in The Ship Who Killed? Well, previously on The Ship Who Killed, Helva gets a new brawn named Kira, and their mission is to deliver test tube babies, uh, or maybe the sperm samples and eggs from all these different worlds to uh, like a one planet that's having this like rampant infertility issue. So it's like the biggest like sperm donation run in the history of the universe. Uh, they are, I guess, infertilized embryo that they need to transfer to this planet who was stricken infertile based off of a solar flare, which is just a buck wild way for that to happen. If Jurassic Park has taught me anything, the best way to get those embryos there is going to be inside of a can of Barbasol shaving cream. You give it to Newman and he's going to, well, no, that's a bad way of doing it. Actually, he, he doesn't get the embryos off the island. Um, but Helva does her job damn good. Yeah, that's kind of how I thought about it when they were talking about putting it in the ship. They're just hanging canisters with the red and blue stripes around them, kind of looking like a barbershop. So after Helva's delivering the embryo, she gets to the death cult planet, basically. 
Yeah, this is essentially um, oh, what's the name of the planet in Star Wars? The where they have in a well, so not crack in, a, in, No, no, no. In Revenge of the Sith, at the very end, uh, they're doing their the Duel of the Fates lightsaber crack battle into at that planet with just pff, pff, crack into it. You will call it that. Uh, that's what I was imagining the planet that this story has its um, climax on. Because it's like an active volcanic world. There's noxious fumes that are getting the the residents of this planet high and making them susceptible to this cult worship. Um, and I so it was kind of a change of pace from these really beautiful worlds that we'd been on. And in the interior of Helva, I imagine is nice and glittering. Uh, so it's it's just this volcanic death planet. Yeah, it seemed like it. You know, uh, Helva talks a lot about being invincible and how these places aren't going to really affect her that much, but. Yeah, they they paint it in a very nasty light. And, you know, that is to say, like, she is on a mission to bring these embryo to a different planet. This planet is a place that she is actually supposed to go pick up more embryo, um, a kind of a last minute addition, which brings up a lot of emotional issues for Kira, which we will definitely dive into later. But um, this was actually kind of a trap that was set on Helva by a mysterious villain. Yeah, we actually have like a real antagonist in both of these stories, which I think is like really necessary and i really like these stories both of them because each one has a character that yeah it's like you said sets a trap for helva or like sets her up for failure or like pushes the story along whereas before helva was just kind of uh maybe blazing her own trail which is a great way to start but i was i really loved having like a villain in this one Uh, so they're they're on hell they go to hell essentially to pick up a bunch of embryos and the kira can't go to every planet they can only go to certain worlds because Kira has um, a couple of internal issues. It's interesting with every single story, we get kind of these major issues, I think, that were happening in the 1960s. I mean, we've dealt with a story that had to do with uh, a pandemic. We dealt with a story that had to do with, like, mental issues. We're de- Later, we're going to be dealing with a story that's, you know— um, kind of hell of his internal struggle. Uh, it's interesting that we're just consistently working on these kind of major issues throughout each story of hell of his career. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, Kira specifically has um, some pretty big issues. And I think that this um, story talks a lot about assisted suicide uh, and whether or not we should allow that, because a lot of planets allow this. And those are the planets that Kira can't go to. She has got to stay on the planets where they value life and don't let you um, take your own because of past sadness. Hats off to Anne McCaffrey on this one. She did such a good job with unveiling this information to us it was very subtly disseminated to us that kira had this issue she was blocked from these planets we don't really know why well whatever who cares she's got a guitar so let's talk about that for the next 10 pages well let's talk about that for the next 10 minutes actually because that's that the music is the most interesting part of kira's story in my opinion obviously the reason why we're doing this is for the romance and we're gonna squeeze it out of the story wherever we possibly can so let's get into kira a little bit kira belongs to a religion or philosophy in this universe known as uh, she is a Dylanist, which is a religion based around the songs of Bob Dylan, which I think is written in both novel and a little you because what a risky maneuver to name a futuristic religion after a contemporary music artist because you don't know how the staying power of Bob Dylan it well okay luckily I do gotta say I trust the staying power of Bob Dylan I can see this being realistic as soon as I read that sentence Dylanism I was like oh no (laughs) as soon as I saw that word like there's no way she did this to us and it's like a philosophy based around (laughs) his music imitating his music uh using his music to inspire yourself and others uh the the music it's kind of like the idea that the song pushes forward like protests and the right like the the ideas of individuality i mean it was very interesting it was very 1960s she could have gone with any or she could have been like a ringo starian he's gonna be the one who lasts we have two more books if you're gonna tell me that there isn't a planet named ringo or they're not in like the star galaxy or something like that there's there's (laughs) no way i will bet you money i wonder if you she, wander. I wonder if uh, <laughs> perhaps uh, Fan McCaffrey were alive and if she had written, I can't do the whole bit that way. If It's okay. I wonder if Anne McCaffrey had been alive today and wrote the book, if she would have picked a contemporary star. So I, I came up with a few. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. Hit me with them. Uh, there she could. Uh, one of them would be an Ariana Grandian. Ooh. This would be a good religion. <laughs> Ugh, you know Taylor Swiftians would just be all over rampant in the galaxy. <laughs> Swiftian sort of sounds like a more high literary concept. No, 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 we worship Taylor Swift. 
Oh, you know who I would want to hang out with would be the hmm. Kendrick Lamarians. They would, would be chill, I feel. That would be cool. Do you think they're more of like a settle the planet and just hang out piece? Or are they more of like, we're going to turn you all to our ways. It's chill, but you're going to have to be kind of subservient to the Lamar ways. Um, he, I think the second one you said, I think he would, <laughs> he would rule on high or someone in his place. Uh, and you would have to follow certain strictures. Does Kendrick Lamar wear a glove? Because I was going to say iron fist, but maybe a leather embroidered um, glove fist. Maybe. I'm sure that Kendrick Lamar has <laughs> gloves. I don't know that he's known for wearing them. I don't actually, I never look at his hands. That's one, that's one of my rules. When I meet a new person, I never look at their hands. Well, and if you're a Lamarian, you better not fucking look at my hands. I think we should try to get him to give us five dollars <laughs> for just five for the low, low price of five dollars. We will make fun of you on we our podcast. Un- we'll unbeep the part where we shit all over you and the religion of the future, potentially. One thing I really liked about this story was that we got to see Helva, I think, develop some real emotional feelings for her brawn. Whereas Theoda in the previous story, it was a little bit more clinical. They were super busy. There really wasn't time for them to fall in love, so to speak. But I really think that um, Helva and Kira, there's some sparks flying there. What do you, what, what was your take on You know, on I never really felt that Theoda and Helva really had that relationship because technically Theoda wasn't a brawn. She didn't have the training to kind of be what Helva needed as a partner. I think that with Kira, you know, she's obviously put into that situation. And I think Helva is infatuated with her immediately. I mean, the way that she describes kind of mm. like her body and the way that she moves and her entrance in the ship, it's very, um, it's very like beautiful. It's very, uh, she's enjoying it. She's taking getting in the eyeful, the camera full. Yeah. Compared to um, what's the medical officer in the last one who's like bumbles on board as a like one man, three stooges, <laughs> the blanket is <laughs> <Dragon's head. laughs> slamming around and stealing the coffee. <laughs> Everybody fucking loves coffee in this. You can tell that Anne McCaffrey is a caffeine or was a caffeine nut. There uh, are a God few very key points. Caffeine. Bob Dylan. She loves space. And on top of that, you know, I do want to bring up with most of our protagonists in these stories, there is this kind of like sexual sneakiness of them. I think with our last story, you know, we saw a lot of revelations in the sexual nature of like this is what i like or i have these secrets that i hid from the reader we're seeing helva turning off her cameras Mm. wink where she's actually saying i'm still listening though or they didn't specifically tell me to turn off all audio and it's like (laughs) reluctantly turning off her cameras in the toilet yeah we get a lot of this like helva kind of doing a little snooping when it's maybe not appropriate and i do i'm like "Mm, helva you got a little bit of a little bit of humanity left in you wait that's a gross (laughs) connection (laughs) Helva takes Kira and uh, all these embryos to Dathomir, and uh, they're there to pick up, allegedly, some more embryos, and uh, no one's really heard from this planet in a while, and they get there, and it's just shitty. It's full of lava, and there's, like, men in hoods immediately ready to, like, take them away. It's so suspicious, Um, and basically, as soon as they land, they take Kira away, and then um, the cultists start chanting. Like, when did you know that they were not on the up and up? Pretty quickly when that man, I forget the, the gentleman's name who came onto the ship and was being like overtly aggressive with Kira and was uh, mentioning all of his like religious beliefs to her right off the bat and wouldn't take his hood down. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, I've grown up in the time where our parents are telling us if a man in a hood pulls up in a van, don't jump in. And it seems like Kira's maybe more like, sure, this sounds like fun, maybe. <laughs> Wait, specifically, what if a man doesn't have a hood on and he wants you to get in his... You get in immediately. Get in immediately. I mean, that's... Lo- he course. lost his puppy. What are you waiting for? <laughs> He's... <laughs> You have to help this gentleman. Uh, yeah, I, it, I think that same gentleman, as soon as Kira's gone, he, like, turns back to Helva and is like, the barefaced hobbit will be given the unjust reward, thousands to die to expatiate the sin of him who is the god. And it's like, okay, all right. I guess it's immediately. <laughs> and I think that, that that line is immediately followed up with, that was enough for Helva. <laughs> she, like, locks all her doors, goes into lockdown and tries to <laughs> rescue. Well, Kira. she's like a super smart computer. I mean, a lot of stuff before that should have been that line. That seems like, you know, a missed opportunity to jump ahead of, ahead of it. <laughs> yeah, the cultists all have, like, t- ceremonial blades that they're rising and practicing their stabbing motions. And she's like, mm, <laughs> suspicious. I think my favorite twist of this book, though, was kind of the reveal of who sits atop the volcano, who is influencing all of these terrible cultists the cult leader. with the fun noxious gas yeah, the foe the fun noxious gas of the planet that makes everyone really just we wash up you as soon as they smell it yeah cultist acid i guess so mac can you hit us with this dramatic reveal yes uh in a scooby-doo unmasking turn of events it turns out that the leader of the cult is 
another shell ship. <gasps> what? Zoinks. Ruh -roh. And it is the rogue ship that we heard about a little bit earlier on uh, who had escaped from her duties, I guess, to the company and uh, <laughs> went rogue, went to this planet, crashed in, probably trying to kill herself and end things um, in, 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 in her mourning. Um, didn't die, however, was simply malfunctioning and uh, all, was sort of forcing these people into a suicide cult in order to feed her own sick desires as a sick space ship. Helva has a great line in here um, when she realizes that they're all that the the cult is sort of a hive mind in some ways because they're all hooked up to each other with technology and they're all like able to hear what the ship is saying. And she says this line, um, great glittering galaxies. This religion must be made of schizoids. And just, <laughs> great glittering galaxies is an awesome alliteration. And he did it. So in order to free the cultists, Helva hacks into their system, starts talking to them as though she's the rogue ship, uh, makes them back off, makes lets Kira get inside, and uh, they're actually able to deliver this like failsafe word that causes the rogue ship to uh, self-destruct, giving them what they wanted, um, and Helva comes away with a new perspective. Yeah, and with this new perspective, you know, I think she found that she was able to look forward to a new brawn again. She was able to find some more about herself. And uh, she was able to grow a little bit. Um, if you're looking to uh, grow, it would be great for you to share this show with your friends, help share something during this time of pandemic. Uh, <laughs> if you're looking to expand your new horizons, you can take a look, uh, listen to some of our older episodes. Uh, we have finished one of our books before called Bear by Marian Engel. That one is a lot more romantic in a very different uh, yeah, way. Yeah, so romantic. If you're for... <laughs> no, that's the right word. <laughs> yeah, a little loose with the word romantic, but if you're looking for something a little bit different, that's another something we've got for you. Yeah, and if you are enjoying the show, um, take a minute, if you would, to head online. You can go to iTunes, leave us a review. That stuff's really important to get the show out to people who might not have heard of it before. Um, and if you don't want to do that, the, really the best thing you can do if you do love the show is to tell somebody about it. Uh, let your friends know if they like romance novels or preferably if they don't like them at all. Uh, let them know about the show. Like I said, we got one in the can. This one, uh, Ship Who Sang, we're reading for one more week after this, and then we'll be onward and upward to our uh, to our third book after that. So rolling ahead. Uh, if you want to send us some fan mail, um, some uh, there's some great artwork for the Ship Who Sang. Uh, if you've got some fan art or if you just found a good cover, send it our way. Uh, our email is grbooknook at gmail.com. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. You know, all those places. All right. And I think that's going to bring us to the fourth story in the collection uh just to run through we've read the ship who sang the ship who mourned the ship who killed and now dramatic mission yeah it is a little bit robotic right off the bat mm -hmm. um but i did happen to write a little description for our listeners just so as we kind of slog through all of the different things that happen so in the story happens. give them a nice concise little synopsis do you want to hear it oh yeah hit me with it please so here's what i have put together as a reader for dramatic mission Helva is tasked with flying four humans before taking on her next brawn, who all turn out to be actors entangled in a dramatic love triangle. Helva reveals her acting prowess she apparently has, and is enticed to join their mission of performing Romeo and Juliet for an amused, starved planet of super aliens. She is able to mind transfer into this new form and experience life as an organic being, but rejects the temptation to stay behind with the others. That's pretty good. I, I that's mean, pretty much what happens yeah i've Anne mccaffrey wasted like 40 fucking pages <laughs> she, she could have just done that and been one, one and done uh yeah so she's transporting these actors these shakespearean actors to an alien planet because they're gonna trade romeo and juliet for like fusion technology Oh, Mac, I got to say, with our theatrical background, this was just so juicy. When Dramatic Mission, the story we've been making fun of so long, was about theater people? Are you uh, kidding this me? This ought to be good, I said, pushing my <laughs> glasses up my nose and <laughs> licking my finger to turn the page. Helva doesn't want this job. She's, she's, she's like bummed out. She wants a new brawn. And the idea of like taking a bunch of actors to a random planet is just like death to her. Yeah, the idea of not getting that partner again, I think she really emphasizes in the story. Like, I'm not going to work for you again if you don't give me my brawn. You got to think, too. I feel kind of sympathetic for her. She's stuck in this ship. She's trying to have this emotional connection. But now she's just acting like a ship. It's It's got to be tough. Yeah, and sort of slowly it comes about that she does have some acting ability. And they let her start playing <laughs> some of the parts in their rehearsals. And they end up giving her the role of the nurse in Romeo and Juliet, which is, I guess... 
a little I, if I were Helva, I'd be a little insulted. It's not a very juicy part, but it's necessary. She was so desperate for any part, though. I mean, the entire time we're reading them rehearsing, she's like, well, you know, I'm not that interested. But anyway, I turned on my camera and I heard everything they were saying. (laughs) And I started reciting poetry in the middle of my sleep. Oh, yes, I know every word to every play ever written. She does completely insert herself in that situation. It's kind of like, you know, that remember that actor when you would just be doing your lines in rehearse and they bust through the doors and read your part better and then they take it from you. She kind of does that to like answer it. <laughs> she just reads a line out of nowhere and she wasn't supposed to. And everyone's like, you're amazing. Kind of oversteps it. She's kind of the fifth drama person in this in this terrible Pentagon. She, she does add a big element of drama to the whole group. It like causes some rifts <laughs> among these people. Um, my favorite character in this was a uh, uh, his name is Prain, the director of the whole shebang. The director and the star. And he's like a 90-year-old dude who's memorized every play he's ever been in because he takes a memory drug like every day. But it's made his bones hollow and weak, so he has to perform in zero gravity. And in like the – he performs also with – I don't – okay, I didn't really understand this part. They are actors who are super old but they're playing younger characters in their show because they can put their minds into some shell or some like image. I totally no problem. I got you on this one. So they're actors in general. They're able to play old because of just the advancements in medical science. It seems just subtly in the book, people were able to live to like 180. So 90 was like, you know, they said second century, just kind of like as it's a normal thing these days. I assume people live to 150. In this situation, the planet they're going to is intolerable for human conditions, but the aliens are so advanced that they built a machine that lets them, pro- or no, sorry, the humans built a machine that lets them project into a body that these aliens have created, just their conscious knees. Do you think? Conscious knees. Do you think that Helva was like, well, that's kind of bullshit. So you can take a mind and put it into another body, and yet you made me into a spaceship? <laughs> it's like, wait a minute. This, this is, doesn't really seem fair. This is a little <laughs> tricky. But, oh, no, hold on. I'm Do- in debt. I'm in debt forever. I'm in debt for my entire life. I'm enslaved, essentially. You could have just... I could be walking around looking like Marlon Brando. It would have been so easy and so straightforward. Oh, I, I feel I for her. be Brando. <laughs> so, okay. So you're saying that uh, if he's like 90 years old, he's really middle-aged. And so it's, it's cool. The concept of paying for advanced alien technology with a play is hilarious. I think this... Oh. this, t- this alien race who has gone so far they couldn't even come up with anything creative and i well kudos to us though for giving them something good because it sounds like they would have taken anything we could have sent them uh the adam sandler film jack and jill and they probably would have been like yes that's true i'm glad there was some kind of classical piece of art that we were sending over i mean i think they would have gotten a kick out of jackass but it certainly would have changed the end of that story (laughs) jackass 3d so um, speaking of this, uh, it's called the beta core view psych transfer process, just the way that works. Basically, what we find out in the story is you can just do that to anybody, anywhere and turn into a body. There's a moment where we find out that Helva is able to maybe potentially insert herself into humans, which we'll get into later. First, I want to know if you could psych transfer into anything, anything, anything. What would you psych transfer into? I'm talking automobiles. I'm talking trees. I'm talking, I don't know, plants, which is a small tree. A tr- okay, a tree would be nuts. Uh, that would just be... Well, you'd make nuts. Just, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I think it would be too ticklish with the squirrels crawling all over me. If I was a tree, though, I would be like the giving tree. I would be like, take it all. <laughs> you'd make a boat out of me. You would love me. Um, You're a little bit easy as a tree, my dude. What about what about you? What are you, what are you turning into? I think if I was going to mind transfer into something, I would want to mind transfer into something that would um, get a lot of use, but also be individual to a certain extent. Okay. So I think I would want to be um, a fish that constantly escapes being eaten by a pelican. <laughs> okay. So I'm constantly getting swept up in its mouth and I'm panicking and I'm swimming around, but I make it out every single time. I think that's like, that's the kind of level of excitement that I'm looking for in my life. Okay. And I think so that really- while I was watching Cars, you were watching Finding Nemo. <laughs> Yeah, and <laughs> I was, we're on the other end of the Pixar okay, spectrum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so as we've discussed before, obviously there isn't an overabundance of romance in this book, which we have, I would say, with great love in our hearts, we've squeezed out for our listeners just to find some moments of passion. Um, I would like to argue with you that I think Helva has sex in this book. I think she absolutely has sex after they do the performance. 
in this story? Oh, in yeah. The d- dramatic. Is that the drama of the dramatic mission? I don't. I think the drama was the entire trip there where the uh, theaters, okay. people were being catty. But <laughs> OK, I'll bite. Why? Because I didn't get that impression at all. What, what? When do you think Helva gets down and dirty? All right, here we go. Here are my lawyer points because I'm a lawyer. <laughs> After they complete their performance for the Karviki, which are the alien race, they celebrate by emptying positive forces into oh. nearby Karviki that are empty of these forces. Then they went to be refilled by a new individual. That's nasty. Oh. <laughs> that right there's nasty. Point number two. After they get back from this frenzy of an amazing show, everyone was so overblown with ecstasy they needed to take space medicine to recover. AKA space smokes. Yeah, Helva did seem a little drained after everything. Here's my final point, which I think will lead us into a, like the end conversation. It was so good, it turned a few humans Corviki. <laughs> <laughs> Once you go Corviki, you're never going to be a human being again. Yeah, I mean, that's, it doesn't that's, rhyme, but it's true. And that's and you're right. I think that is maybe one of the most dramatic moments of this story is when we get to that revelation where that is an option for these people. I think you're right, because actually their whole the whole Corviki species, that energy transfers and that ecstasy of the transfer and the filling is like every part of their being. Mm hmm. And they constantly are talking about shooting energy at each other. Oh, and mm-hmm. OK. And they, OK, let's because they don't have any stories. That's the thing is they don't have plays, movies, books. Right. And can you imagine being like this sexual race and there's no culture and then you see Romeo and Juliet now, by today's Earth standards, that's not that sexy of a story. It's not that hot. But would you, if you've been starved for any type of attention, I, that was basically like a huge porno. And that just led on that kiss at the end. The Corvikis just probably were just so hard for it. That's exactly how I read that entire moment. I mean, they were just like, exploding with ecstasy is literally what she wrote in one of the paragraphs. Like, that to me, you can't you can't argue against me. That was nasty. They did the dirty thing. And Helva finally, 150 pages into this book, had sex. Oh, it's a little bit of Bob's your uncle on the Corviki planet. It's amazing because what greater treat could you have at the end of a play that you directed and starred in that you give such a compelling performance as Romeo that the entire theater devolves into an orgy upon the curtain coming down? Yeah, I mean, the entire theater then has sex with you, which is like, great, I think you did it. I'm pretty sure that's the only way to know you did a perfect job. It really was a standing O. Silva puts the O in the standing elevation. <laughs> but yeah, you're, I think you were about to say um, that it, the, the sex was so good that some of them did not want to come back. They didn't want to be in these useless meat sacks anymore. Three of the people, including Chadris, you bastard, decide to stay as Corviki. <laughs> and they try to entice Helva to stay with them. And, I, you know, I think in every one of our stories, we see this moment of Helva's... Um, inevitable rebellion and this was such mm. a powerful moment like this would have been her moment to become a, a different being to experience a new life and she fought against it she decided to stay as a ship yeah she has to decide twice first if she wants to stay with the others and be a Corvikian and live in this uh, constant orgasm and then once she goes <laughs> back to herself in the ship there are these empty bodies of the humans that have transferred their minds to the planet and she is sort of presented with this option or at least this idea of you Kelva could just jump into one of these people that was quite an interesting twist I didn't see that coming at all and having one of the people who decided to stay behind try to convince Helva you know it a lot of people take pity on her and I think the whole book we've seen Helva say you know I'm awesome what I get to be is really cool but every human interaction is you're finally going to be free you're finally going to get to do this you know it makes me wonder is that the conditioning where Helva believes that this is perfect for her. This is what she wants. Is it actually that terrible? You know, I'm curious if that's something we're going to see in the final stories, if that's going to come to light. Yeah, I mean, the book starts, we talked about this a little bit in the first episode, about how the book bends over backwards to make us think that them being in these ships is the best thing that could happen to them, and that she needs to kind of accept her fate. And Helva's all throughout very proud of what she is and what she's capable of. Plus, the people that are left for her to jump into are kind of shitty. There's like a 90-year-old man, the woman who was like a total bitch to her. And then Chadris, the failed... And then Chadris. <laughs> the failed brawn, who, like, she would have jumped in and then had to be retired, so that might have been a bummer. <laughs> yeah, nobody wants to be stuck inside of that dweeb's body. <laughs> he was a dweeb. I have one final note I'd like to talk a little bit about, and it is a new mm-hmm. sexual attraction toward Helva. I think oh. Supervisor Parlin 
is hot for Helva. That supervisor that comes in at the end and offers her the body to transfer into. He's oh, yeah. drunk. He's calling her all kinds of sweet little names. He's absolutely he, trying to get a little action. He, won, he, he ends up slurping some soup inside of her, <laughs> yeah. which is, uh, when I say it out loud, pretty gross. But when you read it, it's a little romantic. It's not romantic. He's drunk and he kind of breaks into her, which is a terrifying sentence to say out loud. And he's her boss, too, which also sort of raises some ethical questions. Yeah. But I, they were trying to make him into a love interest. I agree with you. It was, she, I mean, they talk to each other a couple times throughout the story, and they're incredibly snippy with each other. And constantly she's like, fuck you. I don't want to talk to you. And then he just assumes that it's time to get drunk and go try to flirt with her. He keeps. OK, I will say he says he's not drunk, but also it seems like he's pretty drunk. Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's how I knew he was drunk is when he said, I'm not drunk. Give me some soup. Uh, I think that's going to do it for us on this section of the ship who's saying um, lucky. Do you want to what are we reading next week? So next week, we're going to finish up the final two stories of the ship who sang. Uh, these books are titled the ship who disassembled and the partnership, uh, which in my mind means that she's going to be torn apart and then two bodies will become one. And maybe we'll finally get that romance we've been so desperate for. The next episode of Gentleman's Romantic Book Nook will come out on July 17th. Mark your calendars. Uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit more the next episode, but we have a pretty fun idea cooked up uh, for the next book. So you're going to stay <laughs> tuned for those announcements. I think you're really going to enjoy our new plan. Fun maybe to listen to. I, I think we might be hurting a little bit. This might be the one we recommend not to read <laughs> this next one. But <laughs> as the stars set on another beautiful adventure with Helva, funding off cultists and actors, where will we go next in the beautiful story of the ship who sang? Will we find redemption? Will we find even more romantic loss? Mac, what can we expect? I'd really like to see her sing a little bit more. She's <laughs> kind of been on the non-singing trend. She hasn't sung in a while. Any romance. Just any amount of like any romance. Any amount of love. If would they be smooched, good. I would love a smooch here and there. That would be great. I'd love for her to have a brawn that doesn't die or <laughs> choose to live in an alien's body. She's like, got to start feeling a little self-conscious when everybody she meets ends up dead. 